Americans face hefty legal bills as they mount a defense against the sprawling RICO indictment. So far, Trump and his political machine have refused to assist with legal bills. So his one-time allies have to scramble to find other sources of funds. His former attorney, Jenna Ellis, who is one of the co-defendants in this case, wrote a post on rebranded Twitter, quote, I was reliably informed Trump isn't funding any of us who are indicted. Why isn't MAGA Incorporated funding everyone's defense? Now, a source close to Trump told CNN, I don't think uh, Ellis would be on the top of Trump's list anyway. Now, since the indictment, Ellis has already raised more than $180,000 through a faith-based crowdfunding site called Give, Send, Go. Joining us now with the analysis, CNN senior legal analyst Ellie Honig, CNN political commentator Errol Lewis, polit politics reporter for Semaphore Shelby Talcott, and the national correspondent for The Washington Post, Philip Bump. Welcome all of you to the table. So uh, I guess being part of this process does not necessarily mean you're going to get the support of MAGA financially. Um, is that all that unusual? I mean, there's a couple cases going on at once yet. What have we seen so far? Yeah, I, I, I don't think it's unusual from the perspective of this is a Trump situation, right? Um, but, and the lawyers can probably speak to this better than I can in terms of whether it's unusual from the broader perspective. But uh, what I think is interesting is you have several of these co-defendants trying to sever their trials. And from my understanding, one of the benefits of severing a trial would be that Trump's lawyers would not then be at that trial. So any um, defense, anything that comes up that implicates Trump Maybe if the trial is severed, the co-defendants aren't going to, you know what I mean, aren't yeah. going to argue against it. So, first of all, I think Shelby's exactly right. One of the advantages to a defendant of having a severed trial, meaning two separate trials, is the ones who go second have a huge tactical advantage. You get to see the other side's playbook. I mean, that is invaluable. On the question about payments for the co-defendants, this is very unusual for a Trump case because he has historically, dating back to impeachment, covered himself by having his PACs and his associated entities pay for lawyers for co-counsel. Now, that's actually not illegal. This happens quite a bit. I and saw it. And people saw yeah. it as being to his benefit, right? To 100 keep these to his... people close. Yes, this is, this is a tactic that powerful, rich people use. It's legal. And powerful, rich corporations. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I mean, corp corporations are a great example. But by paying for someone else's attorney, you make it really difficult for them to flip on you. Because if they do, and if they have the courage to say to their lawyer who's being funded by the boss, hey, I think I, my best interest would be going in and cooperating, you're going to lose that lawyer. You're going to have to pay for your own lawyer, which is really, really expensive. So it's protected Trump before, and now it's not protecting him in the Georgia case. But does, well, the, PAC have the, does the PAC have the money this time around right, to right. pay for it? And if it doesn't, which it seems like it doesn't, would Trump himself, you know, do, yeah. it, I feel like it is you less usual for Trump himself you, you to <laughs> pull his own funds out of it. I mean, he's not even funding his own legal defense largely, right? What were you going to say? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, we saw an example in, in Florida of this guy who yeah. was being, had his lawyer paid for. There was a conflict because he gave false testimony, according to the federal government, and his lawyer also worked for a guy who his false testimony, if he were to reverse that testimony, it would implicate his, his lawyer's other client. So he pulled out of that, and then what he did is he implicated other people in Trump's circuit. And that's the question, right? It's very cheap. If you leave Trump's orbit and then you testify against Trump and you make a deal and then you're out, of, you, you right. don't have a criminal case anymore, right? Yeah. Trump has here two conflicting motivations. He's got the political question, the legal question. They're intermingled, right? The political question could solve his legal question if he's elected president. But so he has to balance people like Jenna Ellis, who he has no indication mm -hmm. to try and help, as that quote said, since she flipped and is working for Ron DeSantis right now. But he's in that same boat with a lot of different people. Do I help them and keep them loyal legally? What does that say politically? Do I let them use my political capital to raise money for their legal defenses? It's really, really complicated. And it seems as though, based on the fact they don't have a whole lot of cash, some of this is going to end up weighing against Donald Trump. Errol, what message does this send to any other potential Trump supporters who may want to go, quote unquote, that extra mile, right? I mean, this right. whole process uh, in justice is sort of an exercise in sending a message. He has given them a lot to think about. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, longtime uh, uh, supporter, friend, going back decades, not getting his bills paid having to go to Mar-a-Lago on bended knee and basically beg for help. And apparently the, the reaction was, 
you know, when Rudy Giuliani says, look, I went to court 60 times for you. And the response was, well, you lost all those cases. <laughs> so, so... I mean, that's a tough uh, comeback. That's, a real, that's, a, real, around, that's yeah. a real real food for thought. Um, and, and look, we know from Michael Cohen, his other longtime assistant... Who talks assistant, about this frequently. Talks about it frequently. He says it was based on the fact that he was left hung out to dry, his family's security was at stake, and that's when he turned and started talking. And, and I think we can expect to see that with, with others as well. Phil, to that point, though, I, I think one of the things, and Ellie, we've talked about this a couple times, like, what is there to flip here? Sure, Which I think is the question. big question, right? Like, Michael Cohen knew all the things about all the things uh, in terms of the Trump organization and what, what the former president was doing in his, his business life, pre-political life. You look through the indictment, the Fulton County indictment, you look through the Jack Smith uh, indictments as well, where uh, it, it seems like on the documents case that kind of already rolled up everybody that's in the uh, in the crosshairs to some degree. I'm, I'm wondering what, what the flip is here. Yeah, yeah I and mean, so the guy we talked about in Florida had a very concrete thing. Yep. He right. said they asked me to delete this surveillance footage, right? Yep. So that's a very specific thing. Again, this is all alleged according to the indictment. Uh, and it's a good question, right? The RICO indictment in Georgia has a lot of different components, a lot of establishment of fact that needs to be done. We've already seen some of the defendants there say, yes, Don, I, you know, I did this fake elector thing because Donald Trump asked me to things along those lines. I don't know. I mean, you know, Jack Smith, Fannie Willis, they know, they know the sorts of things that they're going to be willing to trade for, right? There may, there may be nothing. They may not, you know, someone may say, look, I'm ready to come to your side. I'll, I'll do whatever you need. And they may say, you, you don't have anything. Like, there's nothing you can do for me. Uh, so it's a good question. And especially because some of these uh, charges are very complicated and rooted. I don't, I don't want to say they're, they're, they're sort of loosey-goosey, but they're like sort of ideological to some extent. You know, there's sort of, there, there's a theory of the case that needs to be made. I'm not an attorney. I can maybe speak to this, but, yeah, you know, but more maybe importantly, there's, there's four of them, and you've got to pay for lawyers for all of them while running a campaign. That's, That's right. It's it's extremely expensive. I mean, you know, we've seen a how lot Donald of Trump has been hours. drawing yeah. down a lot of his political money to pay for this, and those so, some of these lawyers actually do want to get paid. You know, uh, Donald Trump is famous for stiffing his attorneys. Not everybody's going to get that kind of a deal or have that kind of an influence. The judge overseeing the 2020 election interference case against former President Donald Trump and his 18 co-defendants is giving the green light for all proceedings in his courtroom to be live streamed and televised. Judge Scott McAfee says he is following the precedent that was already set by the judge who handled preliminary matters in the case. But a reminder, Trump's federal cases in Florida and D.C. do not allow cameras inside the courtroom as a rule. So how big of a deal is it for this ruling? Joining us now with the analysis, CNN senior legal analyst Ellie Honig and CNN senior media reporter Oliver Darcy, welcome back. So um, Trump, who's like in a deposition or Trump, who's in a legal proceeding, I feel like is a little different from the person people see in public as a candidate, as the former president. How significant is this? It's a big deal to see these proceedings live. And I think it's very important that Georgia has said that they will show it live. The problem is that trial is very likely to be well after the election. The two that are most likely to be before the election are the two federal cases where, of course, federal courts have long had this rule that they don't allow cameras in the courtroom. Now, I've been objecting to and sort of ranting about this rule, and here's why. If you ask the federal courts why they can't have cameras, they'll say, well, we have a rule. Who made that rule? The federal judges themselves. Who can change that rule? The federal judges. It's not as if hostile alien overlords came down and d demanded that. <laughs> it is that a very, it's a thing judges are often chafe against, right? It's yeah. not something that they wanted. The Supreme Court took forever to embrace this. Can you talk about yeah. why? Like how, once we have something in, in the public view like this, how does it change things? I think it's an antiquated view. I mean, I, I, the, the big argument is that they don't want these uh, courtrooms to become reality television sets. Uh, but I think we can all agree that's probably not going to happen. And I'd point to the Alex Jones trials. Those were streamed live, and if anything is going to become unhinged and just go off the rails, it's going to be the Alex Jones trial. And we managed as a country to get through those trials streamed live on YouTube. And I think it was actually good for the public. But did we care public. about it the same way we care about sure. the former president? Well, probably not the same level. I think the Trump trial will be the most watched trial of all time. And if any others are, are streamed, it will be, um, you know, highly rated. People will pay attention. But I do think at the end of the day, that those trials showed you can stream uh, this on YouTube, online, allow the public to see it and see the evidence before these people for their own eyes, with their own eyes. And I think it was beneficial. I think in the absence of this, you have a void of information that allows conspiracy theories, misinformation to thrive. And with the former president, um, obviously that's always a factor. So streaming it live lets the public see it, opens it up. If I can second that, 
the Derek Chauvin trial, who was convicted of murdering George Floyd. We watched all of that live. Perfectly dignified, fair proceeding. The Kyle Rittenhouse trial, same thing. The trial of the men who murdered Ahmaud Arbery, same, all in state courts. We watched those live, nothing wrong. All these fears that judges have.